Good afternoon. This is Garrett Ukulele with the National Governors Association. Thank you for joining the webinar today. We're going to wait another minute or two. Um, some more people are trickling in as I speak, so um, we'll hold off and get started in, in about two minutes. Good afternoon. This is Garrett Ucolito with the National Governors Association. Thank you for joining the webinar today, uh, which we've titled The User Pays a Potential Solution to the Transportation Funding Crisis. Uh, we're joined by two great uh, panelists today who are really leading the way on the issue of uh, looking at an alternative funding solution to help us at the state level um, and at the national level figure out how to pay for our transportation infrastructure. Um, my name, as I said, is Garrett Ucolito. I'm the Transportation Program Director here at the National Governors Association Center for Best Practices. For those of you who don't know what NGA is, um, we are the voice of the 55 governors here in Washington, D.C. We have several different parts of NGA. Um, I uh, am when, in the Center for Best Practices where we work directly with governors, policy staff to bring um, solutions to them on how to help their states uh, address their problems. This is our division. It's the Energy Infrastructure and Environment Division uh, here at NGA. As you can see in the middle right-hand side is our transportation uh, work that I lead. We have done some work on traffic safety, electric vehicles. We had just recently held a transportation technology workshop last week here in Washington, D.C. And later this year, we're going to host a annual Transportation Policy Institute. Uh, the Transportation Policy Learning Network just launched in October of last year, so we're still getting um, our feet underneath us. Um, but we are looking forward to continue to hold more webinars on topics that governor's offices tell us they want to hear more about. As you can see from the uh, timeline here on your screen, um, we are uh, having a couple more webinars later this year, and then we'll be rescoping what work we want to provide next year for governor's offices based on that feedback. None of that would be possible, though, without the, the work of our supporters, um, Waymo, Deloitte, Meridium, 3M, and Floor, as um, all have been very supportive of the work we're doing here and trying to advise governors um, policy advisors on um, transportation issues. So with that, I want to get to our uh, panelists today. We have Trish Hendren, who is the Executive Director of the I-95 Corridor Coalition, and Maureen Bach, who is the Chief Innovation Officer with the Oregon Department of Transportation. And they're here to talk to us about um, road use charges or mileage-based user fees, um, both of which essentially are the same thing, a different way for us to look at how, how to pay for our infrastructure that we desperately need to help our economy can, can you continue to move forward. Before we get to the presentation, so I want to provide you some information on how to submit your questions. So um, on your screen, you should have a little box in the GoToWebinar uh, box there and you have a pull down for questions. When you click on that, you will be able to enter in and type your messages there. We will see that on our side, and when it gets time to answer questions at the end of the webinar, we will use that to read out the questions to our two panelists and have them respond to you. For any of the questions we don't get to today, we will try to aggregate them 
try and get some short written responses and get feedback to you all um, in our email out to you after the webinar. We will also have a recording of the webinar posted on our website at uh, nga.org. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Trish Hendren um, with the uh, I-95 Corridor Coalition, who's going to talk to us about what the problem is and why we're talking about this. Great. Thank you, Garrett. Just a sound check. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good. All right. Great. Uh, so thank you again, Garrett, and uh, thank you to the National Governors Association and to each of today's webinar participants for really helping you know, us figure out a long-term solution to our transportation funding challenge. And when I say challenge, what, what, and what is the issue that we're trying to address? forwarding to the slides here. Hold on. There we go. So in essence, it's a, a three-pronged problem I would present it as. So the first challenge is that our transportation revenues are declining. So we're collecting basically less funds for the miles driven by cars, which is great for our, our wallets, um, given that we have more fuel-efficient vehicles that are out there, but not so great when the transportation system is dependent on the fuel tax, so one major source of funding for our transportation system is that fuel tax. So the other challenge here is the purchasing power of the revenue generated from fuel tax is not keeping up with our growing demands. So add into that that our fleet is changing. As we have a growing number of electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles, this will further undermine the revenue that we need in order to maintain the transportation system and operate it in which these vehicles are driving. And then a third piece is basically the perception, our understanding of how transportation is funded. So in short, people really uh, do not know how transportation is funded and there's a our kind of awareness gap between how much money that is needed to fund our transportation system and how much funding that the public is providing. So kind of in this three-pronged challenge with we have declining revenue, a changing fleet, and kind of this uh, understanding gap, one option that is being explored is a mileage-based usage fee or called a road user charge. Is that a, a long-term solution? And to kind of explain more what in the world a, an MBUF or RUC is, I'm gonna turn it over to Marie. Thank you, Trish. This is Maureen, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what a RUC or an MBUF really is. Um, so I'm going to go back in time a little bit, though. Maybe. I skipped going back in time. Uh, these are basically just extensions of the user pay principles that underlie the first fuel tax that was passed in 1919. And at that time, when Oregon passed the first gas tax, it was really a concern that we needed to do something to get Oregon out of the mud. And the people that it was impacting the most were people that were trying to drive cars. So about that time, the fleet efficiency was about the same for every vehicle on the road, and they imposed a gas tax. That has been baked into our DNA ever since. So it's applied to the first uh, weight mile tax that was imposed in the 40s, and it's now part of the road usage charge program, which is <clears throat> really a pretty simple construct. People still pay fuel tax <clears throat> on the fuel purchase at the pump, but then in the REC system, the miles that they drive are counted, and the fuel used to drive those taxable miles are counted there's a netting of the amount of fuel tax that is paid on the fuel used to drive taxable miles. So basically, people are just paying the difference between a mileage-based fee and what they would have paid in fuel tax to drive taxable miles. And what that does is it allows people to not keep receipts because that netting is occurring as they drive. We here in Oregon use the private sector to administer accounts so people do enroll with 
a private sector account manager that actually provides the technology to capture information on miles driven and on the amount of fuel used. People can select from those private sector account managers and based on the um, value added services that are provided by those account managers, and that includes things like have, being able to geofence where your car is driven, um, being able to check battery health, and that kind of thing. So those are some things that drive people to want to enroll in the program that are different than just paying their taxes. But REC is really very different from other funding me mechanisms. It's very similar to fuel tax in that everyone pays the same base rate. In Oregon, that's 1.7 cents per mile. That is the base rate. Everyone pays that if they're enrolled in the program. Just like here, they would pay 34 cents a gallon when they fueled their vehicle. It's not like congestion pricing, although congestion pricing could be imposed on top of a REC because it's not variable by the time of day or where people are driving. And so it's also applicable to the entire transportation system. So it's not like tolling that is only applied to a certain part of the transportation system. It's also unlike vehicle registration, which is really a vehicle for accessing the system to ensure that you have the right access to the transportation system, but it's not based on the miles driven. So that's another distinction that we like to make. So I'm going to turn it back to Trish to tell you what's going on with the state pilots. Thanks, Maria. We've got a little uh, East Coast, West Coast tag team going on here. Uh, and actually, that's it's not <laughs> it's kind of on purpose that we have both uh, voices in this conversation today because there is quite a lot going on across the state. And what I wanted to do is just touch on a few examples of the work being done and also just highlight even with this work we're going to get more states engaged in this dialogue to make sure that the concerns you might have that are unique to your state are reflected in this national um, exploration and kind of search for a sustainable transportation funding source but the main reason why we've seen kind of an upswell of interest and activity in this exploring the feasibility of a a distance-based fee, I would really give Congress credit here. And the reason why I'm doing that is in the FAST Act, the SIPSA grant program, we love our acronym, so Surface Transportation Systems Funding Alternatives Program was established, five-year program, 95 million in match, in Sierra's 50-50 match program, but it really was to do demonstration pilots, to have, um, people interact with this potential future technology, um, potentially a future way of funding our transportation system. So I'll give you a couple of examples of the work being done, kind of bounce around the country here. So in California, um, they initiated their work actually um, before the CISFA grant, even though I just gave that grant program all that credit. Um, they did uh, have the largest pilot that's been done to date. Um, so we love California for that kind of uh, work that they do, but it was really important to get such a large, diverse group of people engaged. And as other pilots have done, um, they've provided here kind of a, a range of options. You can see these multiple approaches offered, and that's a key lesson learned that we found um, to date. If we're going to move to this type of sustainable transportation funding option, we have to provide people choices. Uh, so moving forward for California, they have a SIPSFA grant now to explore um, other options that we could implement this new transportation funding approach. So we're looking forward to hearing kind of what they find from their work. So looking in Colorado, um, they also had a small self-funded, uh, theirs was small while California was large, um, funded pilot to explore kind of Colorado's reaction um, to this concept. And what they're looking at doing next is really zeroing in on the rural voice and the agricultural communities. And an issue that is raised with a distance-based fee is the misperception that a, a RUC or a distance-based fee would automatically um, be disadvantageous to rural parts of the country. And the data so far is not showing that, but that's an important kind of gut reaction that we have. Um, so we need to really focus on why that perception is out there 
and what we would do to move from perception to kind of more uh, real world data and experience. So again, applaud Colorado for what they're focused on the rural and agricultural voice. In Washington, um, they just completed a rather lengthy uh, pilot and we are very excited as we say the transportation community is really excited to hear uh, the lessons learned from the work that they have just um, just done. In Hawaii, um, a key insight or perspective that the Hawaii work will do is on this manual approach. So with states that have a, a manual, excuse me, have a required annual inspection, there is an idea of linking that up um, with a distance-based fee, so kind of an annual odometer reading. And so again, we want to see Hawaii with their experiences with implementing a distance-based fee through this approach, because again, um, choice is going to be key. And so we want to um, listen to what Hawaii is, is learning for their work and to really figure out how a manual approach could, could be used if there is a national implementation of a distance-based fee. So going um, into Utah, so it was very interesting in Utah is the, the legislature actually acted um, before a pilot in that state um, by passing legislation um, that you can see here that required the DOT to set up uh, a mileage-based usage fee or a distance-based fee approach um, that would be in lieu of a registration fee. So um, that is going to be getting underway here pretty quick. Um, so we're all going to be helping Utah out to get ready uh, again for implementing their approach in the state. There's a few more here um, in Minnesota. I think a very interesting approach that they are doing is let's talk to some of the large um, mobility providers that we have out there. And what would that look like if potentially a shift to a distance-based fee began with partnerships with mobility as a service provider? And again, you can see there's just an amazing range of approaches that are used around the country because we're all trying to figure out um, if this is that long-term solution. So Maureen will probably touch on Rec West, so I'll just briefly um, say that they are this group of Western states, and that is key because we're going to have regional and cross-state issues that are need to be addressed if we move from today's approach of a fuel tax to potentially tomorrow's approach with a distance-based fee. So again, it's important to kind of talking across your, your borders, um, but I'll leave it to Maureen to go into a little bit more detail there. And with that, I'm passing the hot potato back to you, Marie. Okay. Well, so Oregon is one of the blue states that out there in the uh, request slide that Trish was showing you. That's because we actually launched a live road usage charge program on July 1st of 2015. We had previously completed two pilots, one in 2016, one in 2012. And the legislature in 2013 said, we think that this is a viable thing to do. We want you to <clears throat> implement a live road use and charge program by, by July 1st, 2015. And so we did a lot of work before we went live and that involved talking to Oregonians across the state. And they are actually the ones that, that came up with the logo you see there and the name. So like I said before, we were the first state to pioneer a gas tax and a weight mile tax and the first operational road usage charge program, partially because we like a challenge, I guess, if nothing else. But that continues. It, it continues in based on work done by our legislature. So in 20, 2001, actually, the Oregon legislature created a road user fee task force. and that group continues to this day to provide us with policy direction as we grow the program. For example, this legislative session, they are sponsoring legislation to expand the program to have vehicles that get more than 40 miles per gallon, give them the ability to opt out of an enhanced registration fee if they're enrolled in Oregon. So here's some key timelines where we started the task force you can see in 2001. In 06, we did the first pilot that required legislative action. Little stars are where 
the legislature actually gave us permission or direction to go forward. We continue to evolve based on the funding we get through the FAST Act projects. For example, we did a large um, outreach effort, which we actually has changed how we talk about the program and transportation funding in general. That will actually go live on July 1st of this year when we celebrate our four-year anniversary. We're also partnering with Washington um, on their interoperability pilot, and we are partnering with California's partner with RecWest pilot. We also are doing our pilot where we are going to see if, uh, to demonstrate that it is a viable option for what would be essentially a local option kind of road usage tax. And that is similar to what we have in fuel tax where cities and counties can actually enact a local option tax on fuel. So what have we done since we went live? Well, we have been working on addressing public opinion issues. Uh, one, these are three of the common ones. It discourages adoptions of EVs. Actually, we have found that when we talk to people about EVs and just EVs, they realize that good roads are essential for them as well as for everyone else. And there are other ways to incentivize, incentivize adoption of electric vehicles, such as rebate programs. And then when they start looking at charging an additional registration fee, that ends up being unfair to EV drivers that drive very few miles compared to those that drive a lot of miles. And we hear that repeatedly. I think in part, one of the reasons that we have EV owners wanting to enroll in the program is because we have a lot of work that we've been doing with our electric advocacy people, and they are actually sitting, have a seat at the table in the Road User Fee Task Force. So they actually are good proponents of the program. We also hear that it's unfair um, to people say, well, I pay, you know, so much more than someone else. Well, if everyone's paying the same amount per mile, then you can actually change your behavior to determine how you drive. It's the same argument that comes up when we talk about to rural people and they, they start from a point of it's unfair compared to urban drivers. What we found in Oregon and what Rec West has also found is that rural drivers might actually benefit from a road usage charge because they tend to drive less efficient vehicles. So they're already paying more per mile to use roads than urban drivers. We are, like I said, working on demonstrating interoperability with our um, two Western states on the far you know, left coast, I guess I would have to say. And the one with Washington is very successful. The one with California, we're going to be working on looking at whether or not we've drafted very good um, clearinghouse requirements because we intend to demonstrate that as well. And then this is the local option that I was talking about. So we will be doing three different driving um, tests, if you will. The first one will be a static um, rate in that area that is then the first one that's variable by time of day. Then we're going to layer a central business district in a county and charge two different rates. And then on the corridor option, we will charge in the Portland metropolitan area if the vehicle is on the road for less than five miles. And that is to incentivize throughput on those corridors with understanding that if they drive less than five miles, they probably have other options for different routes. And then we continue to monitor things like the adoption of automated vehicles. Does that change the dynamic? Do, does the <clears throat> adoption of telematics change things? So there's lots of rapidly changing technologies available in vehicles that are possible business disruptors, and, and that has impacts for revenue, as Trish said earlier. So we want to monitor those and make sure that we're preparing for those and that we're being responsive. And having private sector partners actually helps us do that. 
we are also interested in joining the national discussion. So the Mileage Based User Fee Alliance has developed a framework for a national pilot. Um, we are members of MBOFA and we have had input into that framework that they've been talking about. We stay in touch with I-95 Corridor Coalition because they're looking at the intersection of, of rec and tolling and that's of really important interest to us because we are just getting ready to start a tolling program here in Oregon. And of course, interoperability is probably even more critical for the eastern states than it is out west where we have such big geographic areas to cover. The nice thing about Rec West, which is meeting this week actually, is that it's an opportunity to share lessons learned, even for states that are, are monitoring states, which we call tier three states. And it gives us an opportunity to, to have input into requirements as a group, get the best thinking on it. And in this last pilot, we will be, like I said, testing the clearinghouse requirements that we've um, developed so far. And the other thing is we actually monitor one another's projects. And so by sharing lessons learned, that uh, gives every state that's a participant a leg up. The other thing we're looking at is developing a connected vehicle ecosystem because as cars have more and more to say, we think that has an opportunity to become not only important for our intelligent transportation systems that are doing things like controlling variable message signs and giving advisory speeds and those kind of things, but we also think it needs to be part of the physical infrastructure so we can improve safety of mobility and potentially collect revenues from the telematics that comes off vehicles. And like I said, we also want to leverage the private sector. Um, they provide the latest technology solutions. For example, currently we're using a device that goes into the onboard diagnostic port of a vehicle, but we want to be able to move to embedded telematics that is native to a vehicle so people don't have to have that inconvenience of plugging in a device. Um, we also have the private sector administer our accounts so people enroll with them and they collect the data, they handle the transactions, and they bill them, and then they just are paying the taxes to us. We think that also has the potential to deliver an integrated user experience where people could potentially do all of those things. Right now we have one account manager who not only does road usage charge assessments, for us, but they have also um, become certified to do remote emissions testing. So people that are, have a RUC account can do both of those things. And these are the challenges that we continue to work on. You know, having a common vision, is it shared with our partner states? Um, do we have the right private sector partnerships? Are we monitoring evolving technology? You know, um, but the things that are really important are having strong legislative champions and a strong executive that, that really sees that vision and has adopted it. And then increasing public awareness is probably really very, very key to the whole thing. And we spent a lot of time doing that. We've done things like longitudinal focus groups where people over a three month period of time got to tell us what they thought about the program did message testing with them. And at the end of that period of time, we had some people that actually wanted to be in videos. They wanted to roll in the program. They were they went from being very, very skeptical to being advocates for the program. And that's it for me. So I'm going to turn it back to Trish. All right. Thanks, Maureen. Whenever I hear you speak, I'm always um, grateful to Oregon for, I think, the leadership you all have provided in this area, seeing, seeing the map or the um, kind of timeline of events, thinking that you've been plugging our way at this and um, helping forge a path forward um, since 2001 is just um, the rest of the states are, are grateful for that work. Um, and kind of launching back, you know, we're going east coast, west coast here. On the east coast side, again, the work that we have been engaged in is really um, grounded in that SITSPA grant. So that really was a game changer for us on the East Coast um, to provide the opportunity to explore a very challenging topic, which is how do we fund our transportation um, system in the future? And what we wanted to do is focus on 
on four main things. So first is out-of-state uh, mileage, which um, Oregon is exploring with California um, and Washington on the on the West Coast. But for the folks who've lived out there, it is a different environment on the East Coast um, versus here. So I live in Maryland, and in one day I can drive um, to Virginia and D.C. without a problem. So I'm in three three states. I'm giving D.C. statehood there for a minute. And so that's not that uncommon on the East Coast. So the interoperability and cross-state border issues, the complexity that a lot of small states right next to each other create for a distance-based fee is, is pretty large. So we focus on that as one of our key focus areas. And second, as Maureen mentioned, um, we're looking at this intersection between tolling and MBUF. So tolling authorities have been working on interoperability, have been working on out-of-state users of um, the in-state tolling facility. So we need to learn from them. What kind of clearinghouses do they have, hub systems, technology? And so there's just a vast amount of knowledge and experience that we can make sure as we move forward to explore this feasibility that we learn from the tolling industry and have them as a close partner here. We also are very focused on truck movement on the East Coast. Um, it's an incredibly important freight corridor for our country. Um, and trucks are not big cars. They are regulated differently. They pay for the road differently. Um, they're heavy users, heavy payers of the road. So uh, we want to know with their current requirements, the current um, regulations that are guiding the motor carrier industry, what would a shift from a fuel tax to a distance-based fee look like? And so we want to make sure that we have the motor carrier voice um, at the table as we're exploring this. And final is really the, the public's um, what do they want? And for, for this concept here is, in essence, it's a spoonful of sugar that maybe will make this transition from a fuel tax to a distance-based fee go down a little smoother. We're driving around in computers. Um, the amount of information and data in our vehicles is pretty astonishing, but there's a pretty strong firewall between that computer and the driver. So the question is, as our technology changes, what do our drivers want? What do they want to know about their car, about how they drive, about the impact of their trips? Um, so we want to kind of open up this, these value-added amenities um, to see if that is a way to pave a different transportation funding source for the future. All right, so what we've done, I'll go over it pretty quickly. So we did a pilot last summer, a small pilot, and it really was to start momentum and start the conversation on the East Coast. Uh, we provided three different technology options. Again, choice, choice, choice. If you're going to hear anything from this uh, webinar, that's a, a, a key message that we have to provide people with choice if you're asking them to change. So that's what we did. Um, and here's what we found. So five things. So first, that theory that out-of-state miles is important on the East Coast, um, we now have some data to show that it is. So in the pilot that we had, um, one out of five miles was out of state. So that's notable. And if we're gonna have a national system, we need to know how to address out of state miles. On the second um, kind of key finding, we looked at the mileage based usage fee technology. So the devices that were being put in cars to see if it could estimate tolls. The idea being, we wanna simplify people's lives. Um, we don't want to have much, a lot of um, different devices and technology in the car. So we're like, ask the question, could this technology estimate tolls? And the initial feedback is yes, it is possible. There are some caveats there, of course, but it was a, a key finding for us as we, again, look at this intersection between distance-based fee and tolling. So that spoonful of sugar I was talking about, those value-added amenities, they were not as sweet as we thought. Um, my technical um, assessment of the value added amenities was eh, not too good, not too bad. We just, there wasn't that much enthusiasm. So we're going to try something different in our next pilot to see if we can better uh, inform participants of these value added amenities to see if we talk about them a little more, maybe the people will be interested. So jury's out on this. The, the attribute or the value added amenity that was more interesting to those that were interested were vehicle and battery health. And I put myself in that category. Um, so I have young children. And I, before the pilot, I went into my car to drive my kids to school, turn the, um, the key in the ignition, and my battery was dead. So it made my morning very unpleasant. And I would have really liked to have been in the pilot because I would have gotten a message that told me that my battery was getting low. 
and I would have avoided the unpleasant morning. So I personally am, am interested in this, um, but uh, we have to see what others think and see what we can do, what we can find out about this value-added amenities. So this is one of the most important findings, I thought, from our, our first initial pilot. Again, that pilot was really with folks who are familiar with transportation. These are your thought leaders. These are heads of national organizations on the East Coast. These are state legislators. These are DOT employees. So really knowledgeable folks about transportation. And I bring that up because if you look at this finding, the question the, the survey, the beginning of the survey uh, versus the end was really to try to figure out what did you learn about how transportation is funded from participating in the pilot? So you see here, 65% thought that they became more aware of how transportation is funded. And even more interesting, a third of the folks thought they paid more. And I would totally put myself in that category. So for one month, I drove 600 miles. I don't drive a, a ton. But in that one month, in the 600 miles I drove, I only paid $4 in federal taxes and $7 in state fuel tax. If someone had said, hey, Trish, you're going to pay $11 a month to use all those roads and bridges and ramps and traffic lights, I would have laughed. I would have thought, oh, it must be uh, three times that. $11? So what do we do with that? What do we do with that information? And we're going to continue to test this question and see if it was more of an anomaly with the group we had in that first phase. But if the public doesn't know how transportation is funded or how much they are paying, how do we then transition to a more transparent payment approach? So that's going to be a, a, big, um, a big item we have to work through. So the other key finding, the last one I wanted to share, was this challenge with shifting from a fuel tax-based approach to a distance-based approach is privacy and data security. So for those statisticians out there, you will um, hopefully you're sitting down or you'll fall out of your seat. I personally haven't seen such a drop. This is three months in the pilot, and you see a drop of people being highly concerned with the privacy of their data from 57% down to 30. So that type of statistical change is, is very, uh, very unusual. So again, it just kind of tells us that having these demonstration pilots moves us past this gut reaction of, oh, my data won't be secure, I'm worried about my privacy, but then when we found people participating in the pilot, people's concerns, as you can see, dropped dramatically. So what are we doing next on the East Coast? We're going to do more exploration. Um, so you may have recalled in that SIPSFA grant program, it's a five-year program. So three grant um, cycles have been um, completed. And the coalition, uh, we received three grants. Um, so we have a good track record. We're happy with three for three right now. Um, and in the next two phases, we're basically going to get more of the public's voice into this dialogue. So having volunteer pilots, we're going to further test that tolling concept, how to challenge this technology to see if it can estimate tolls. And we really want to explore this privacy and equity concerns across urban and rural areas. Moving forward with our phase three pilot, we're going to partner with Transurban um, and kind of learning from their experience and the, the tolling entity and what they've done in Australia and bring in some new state partners, New Jersey and North Carolina. And I put a star by this and I know Maureen would be nodding her head continually through this work. We're going to be focused on education and outreach. How do we communicate with the public about how transportation is funded. If we have a big gap, again, I keep going back to that about what the understanding is how transportation is funded. So having surveys, focus group, interviews, videos, briefing packages, a website, we just really need to get this um, information out into the public domain. So we're going to be focused on that. And the other piece that um, is, I think just a key focus area for us is one of our four focus areas is, again, on the, the motor carriers. So we have just recently completed a six-month pilot, a small pilot with several motor carriers. And as you can see here, in those six months, traveled in 27 states and 1.4, let's see if I can get the right number here. I was hidden there, 1.4 million miles. And I, I bring that up because, again, trucks are not big cars. They drive different. The amount of miles they put on those vehicles is immense. And what that means is the per rate distance-based fee that is selected makes a, a really big difference if it's um, 
you know, one cent versus or 0.1 cents for, or, or not, it's just the rate setting is going to be just absolutely uh, critical in the motor carrier group. So what we want to do is um, reach out to the motor carrier group, bring their voice in by having interviews with those, the carriers who participate in the pilot and have this motor carrier working group. Jumping back up, um, this would be the quiz for folks on the webinar, if you know what in the world IFTA is. I'll save you from looking it up on Google. It is the International Fuel Taxation Agreement, which in essence is a distance-based fee right now that we have for motor carriers. So what we're trying to explore is what would it mean if we move from a fuel tax-based approach, so tax on the gallons of fuel versus distance. So we're looking into um, that IFTA, approach and to see what that would mean for a distance-based fuel. Um, all right, this is my caveat statement. <laughs> so the identity for a quarter coalition, again, we are embracing the need to find a long-term funding solution, but we do not know if this is the answer. Um, with the 17 states on the East Coast that my organization represents, we have some states that are thinking about this and open to exploring and the other states who are, are not as open to seeing this as the future. So it's important for us to kind of figure this out together and get those concerns on the table. So I'll end with a few slides. I'm excited to hear your questions that hopefully are bubbling up. But just a couple common threads that we've seen from, again, the great work that Oregon has been leading and some of the other pilots around the country. And the first one is that pilots work. They work as a way to move this edge of the public dialogue from gut reaction to let's have an informed, dialogue. So I, again, I applaud Congress for having the SITSFA program. Um, I know we're going through reauthorization. I'm hoping that we're going to have additional funding put towards SITSFA because we just need to keep this state level exploration going because um, it just works. Privacy and data, you saw that amazing drop from 57% down to 30, which was notable, but it still is always going to be a concern out there. So what can we do um, to further address that concern. And the equity issue between urban and rural, um, as well as income equity issues is something that I know the coalition we're gonna be diving into and focus on more in our upcoming work. But what's interesting is some of the preliminary, again, data analysis of who would be impacted by a switch from a fuel tax to distance-based fee. And some of the early findings that I applaud West Rock for doing is showing that um, urban parts of a state may pay a little bit more, actually, in a distance-based fee approach. Suburban areas would pay quite a bit more, but your rural areas would pay less. So some of you may think that doesn't make that much sense, but part of it is the, um, the vehicles that are being driven in those different areas. Um, so there's less fuel efficiency in some rural parts because they're larger vehicles. So I guess I bring this up just to say, it's not, it's, it's a complicated question, so we need to bring some data into the discussion. We haven't touched on this too much yet, but there, right now, um, to, to put it bluntly, it, the fuel tax is pretty cheap to collect. So estimates between one and 2%, um, a kind of administrative cost to collect the fuel tax. And so what we're doing on the coalition is we're trying to put some numbers on what a a distance-based fee approach would be using some of those tolling uh, authority experiences of how they've moved to all electronic tolls. So right now we're you know working with the working assumption that it would increase admin costs by 16%, which sounds horrible, right? You're going from 2% to 18% admin cost, but if you kind of put it into per mile rates, so let's say let's look at Delaware, if they have a a rate. Um, that is not adhere, not including admin costs, it'd be 1.05 cents. But if we included admin costs, it'd be 1.25 cents. So what we're talking about here, just put, um, I guess the simplest way to say it is a fifth of a penny per mile is what we're estimating right now would, would be necessary to cover admin costs. So I bring that in because we gotta put some numbers on this. As you can tell, I'm a numbers person, so we gotta bring numbers into it in order to move the dialogue forward. And the last slide I want to have here is really about this communication. So again, we put a star by the education outreach effort. The reason why we are where we are in this conversation is because of that leadership of Oregon and the work that they've done. So how else can we get this discussion about how we, or basically the need for transportation funding 
and how it is being paid for right now and why we have a challenge. So again, um, I'll switch it back over to Garrett and encourage folks to enter those questions into that question box. And Marina, I'll be happy to, to get in the dialogue. Great, thanks Trish. Yeah, if, uh, feel free to enter your questions into the uh, question box and we'll start answering some of them. Um, one specific question that I actually was asked earlier uh, last week was about this issue and about how it intersects with tolling and um, how I know Maureen talked about how you know people who pay the gas tax or get credited for that but how would it work with tolling Trish are you how has that been built into your pilot given the amount of tolling on the East Coast sure so I was at first surprised by this question, but then I was thinking about it more and it makes complete sense. So my surprise was because the currently if you are using a toll facility, you're paying the toll as well as a fuel tax. So my simple assumption was, well, of course, we'll do the same for a future where there is no fuel tax. So today would be toll plus fuel tax. The future would be toll plus distance-based fee. But what has been surprising is how that is not as easy um, to swallow for many. So I think, do we continue, do we give, for example, some credit for folks that are using a toll facility, give some additional credit for the distance, the miles that they're traveling on that? So I guess the, <laughs> the short answer, Garrett, is, is to be determined. But I think we do need to keep in mind that today's situation and what it is as we're comparing to what a potential tomorrow situation would be. And also this, the distinction with a toll is typically, you know, a, a financing mechanism. It is a toll that is adhered to kind of a premier service. So using a toll facility, I do not foresee that there would be a, a future where you would not pay a toll. I think it's still, that would remain. The mechanism through which you pay that toll, maybe that could change. Could there be discounts if you um, participate in a distance-based fee? There's many like um, ways to adjust a per mile rate to reflect kind of that transition from today to tomorrow. But again, just we need to remember what today is, is that we're paying both toll and fuel. So I think in the future, you have to pay toll plus something. Great, thanks. Um, Maureen, one question came in about, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the different ways people could utilize Orgo. Um, one question came in, and I think Trish touched on this in mentioning Hawaii, but a manual, if they don't want to use the onboard diagnostic port um, uh, plug-in device and they don't want to use a cell phone to track, is it is the manual method simply just a uh, routine odometer reading, or are there other ways that it's done? So we in Oregon do not offer a manual option at this time. We did some work on examining what that would take to implement something like that. And because we're a very small program at this point, limited to 5,000 vehicles, we <clears throat> decided not to employ that method. But yes, we what we anticipate is people would submit their odometer readings perhaps with a, <clears throat> a capture of the odometer of, so they could take a picture with their cell phone or some other mechanism and submit a picture of the odometer reading at various points along the way. And then we'd have some kind of true up mechanism possibly when they go to re-register their vehicle. That's all very labor intensive and of course it also adds more administrative costs on top of something that's already, as Trish mentioned, uh, more expensive to run than a fuel tax program. So as of now, we have it sitting on the shelf at scale. We think that we will have to have a manual option, but we don't have it yet. Okay, great. Um, one question just came in about, um, and I think this is related to uh, potentially the Utah issue um, where it's the question is wouldn't it be simpler to assess a per kilowatt hour, hour fee on EV charging both at home and at public charging stations so 
I think that is being explored. Um, I think that that could be part of that future of a sustainable transportation funding source that would address the changing fleet. So it would address the EV and hybrid vehicles, um, contrib or paying for the use of the transportation system, which many are arguing that they're not. The challenge though is we have the fleet as a whole is becoming more efficient. So we kind of have a, again, I was trying to present it as a three-pronged problem. We have more fuel efficient fleet. So most of our vehicles are going farther on less gas, which is great uh, for our wallets, which is not so great for the, the Highway Trust Fund. But we have a changing fleet where you have some vehicles that are paying, you know, in the EV case, are paying no fuel tax. So I think, yes, having an approach that really focuses just on EVs and hybrids and thinks about how do we put a charge on their electricity use, I think is something to explore by all means. But I think we have to look farther down the road too, um, no pun intended, looking at that long-term funding solution is kind of what we're, we're trying to keep our eye on that um, as we go forward. One question I that agree. I, uh, okay, yes, sorry, Maureen, did you want to weigh in on that? I think one of the challenges there is that for people that use their electricity at home to fuel their vehicle, they don't have the smart metering that allows them to differentiate how many electrons are being used to fuel their vehicle versus just being used in their home usage. Yeah, that's a really good point, Maureen. That, you're right, that came up in some of our um, electric vehicle workshops we held over the past several months. and. Um, it, you know, it, the effort and the cost it would be to install that technology in the home is, I think, one of the big hurdling blocks. Um, the topic of a national pilot, I know that's been discussed. Um, can uh, either of you weigh in on that? I, I know we've heard about that here. Um, people have floated the idea of doing a national pilot under the next uh, surface transportation reauthorization. Do you think that is the uh, best way to go, or should we be um, trying to focus on more state and multi-state pilots instead? Or you can dodge the question. Well, I never don't have an opinion on that issue, so I will just speak as Maureen Bach, who runs one of these things. I think that the approach that Oregon took makes sense on a national level. Start with education. Start with putting together a consortium of people that actually um, represent different industries like truckers, like automobile manufacturers, and have them craft what a pilot should look like based on the, what is being learned through the pilots being run under the existing SIPSTA program. So I think from, again, an organization that kind of brings to this conversation 17 different DOTs and states. I've just seen the benefit of the SITSFA program and the state-based pilots. Um, each state is different. They have unique challenges, unique citizens and concerns. And it's, a, it's been a slow process to get to where we are on the East Coast. So my concern with a national pilot is it might, it's going to go too fast. So I see a big, again, I've referred to this gap of the public's understanding about that there isn't even is a transportation funding challenge or even how transportation is funded. And so I think the need for kind of state-grown pilots and efforts and regional efforts to explore this transition, I think is where a lot of the focus should be. That being said, what we need is a, a national transportation message. And we've been hearing that not just about a distance-based fee, but we've heard that kind of cry um, for the country that we need to have that kind of national vision for transportation. And if you think I've been, you know, what's the public's concern? I mean, transportation is just not a top of mind priority. It's not what I, you know, if you look at surveys about what people are caring about, it's not in the top five. It's, it's people are aware and they understand transportation that something kind of part of their life, but it's not urgent. So we have this kind of gap between 
policy leaders and, and, and citizens. And people really dislike the idea of a new tax, and that's what people will hear. So we have this challenge, but I think we can overcome that by if we kind of step back and look for that national kind of message about transportation. If we go first with the values of what transportation brings, so being able to go to the doctor's office, being able to pick up stuff at your grocery store, having things delivered to your home, the what transportation kind of means in people's lives, we need that national um, messaging there. And I know Maureen's doing that on the on the West Coast. I'm trying to do it on the East Coast, but that's where we really need some national work. And the other piece is the federal fuel tax. So the state pilots have been more focused on the state fuel tax, but there is a need to think about the fuel the federal fuel tax, which again is is pretty efficiently collected. So if we want to change that, um, that's an important question, and that could be asked through a national effort. But again, I'm I'm hesitant to, um, you know, put on my my cheering pom poms and say let's go for a national road user pilot. Um, it's uh, I'm hesitant to to push that far, um, but because I just know how challenging it has been on the East Coast. So I would very much support a national message for transportation and the value it brings and why we want people to pay for this. And also we need to think about the federal uh, funding for transportation, which is, is necessary. So, so those are <laughs> my, my three or four cents, I would say. No, that's really great. Um, I, and I just want to pick up on what you uh, just mentioned. I mean, uh, and you've mentioned this throughout, both of you mentioned, people don't know how much they're paying in fuel tax or what they're paying for transportation. Um, you know, I think even people within government oftentimes don't know what other than the gas tax goes in to help pay for the infrastructure that's being built that they're driving on or riding on. So I think it's important to continue that educational message. Um, one final question, I think, before we uh, uh, are running out of time, um, the issue of, um, actually, let me lump these two together. Um, the fear that moving to this, uh, so one of the issues is to try and get people to drive more fuel efficient vehicles. Um, it's beneficial for the environment. It's beneficial for them um, in terms of uh, the amount of money they're saving at the fuel pump. Um, is there a fear that this will drive people away from um, fuel-efficient vehicles? Is, uh, I put two questions into one there. Do you want to go first and then I'll go? Sure. We have not found that to be true once people look at what they actually pay for transportation. You're still having an incredible savings by not paying fuel tax. Um, for example, electric vehicles contribution, even in a road usage charge program to the Highway Trust Fund, is far smaller than what they would pay ordinarily. So people are not disincentivized to drive a more efficient vehicle because they're still saving money on fuel overall. Yeah, I think piggybacking on that. Yeah, I came across a, a AAA survey, I think it was done just last year, and it said, you know, why are people buying um, electric and hybrid vehicles? And, you know, overall, it was concern for the environment, and then lower long-term costs, which is what Maureen was just touching on, that the cost savings that an individual would have if they purchase an EV is the fuel. That's the main cost savings. So fuel tax, I mean, not to be... Um, <laughs> It isn't the greatest way to talk about it in a public setting, but it's like the foam on the beer. I mean, it's, it's the, the real cost of operating your vehicle is the fuel. So if you have an EV, you're, you're lowering your cost. The taxes is about 15, 12, 15 percent of the, of the total. I mean, a lot depends on the type of vehicle. Um, and we're talking about non-EVs there. So I think we just need to, again, when we talk about the cost of driving and what you contribute, when you are using this system, we have to separate fuel that you purchase from the fuel tax. And again, we just have not as a field done a good job. When you get your receipt, when you go to the, um, the gasoline station, you, it doesn't say how much is state and fuel or potentially local tax. It just gives you a total. So we have a big gap in knowledge. Again, I keep going back to that. 
when we're talking about switching, we need to clarify we're not at what, what part of the cost of driving that we're talking about. So I don't think that a, a distance-based fee necessarily has to be a disincentive as Maureen highlighted. Um, a lot goes into how you implement a distance-based fee and what rates you apply. Um, but I, I think that both policy objectives, um, focus on the environment, lowering emissions, can occur in a distance-based fee environment. Okay, thank you. Um, I did get a couple questions actually via email, so I will um, send those out to, to people, to both of you, to see if we have quick responses to that. Um, but um, with that, um, we did hit time, so I want to thank both Trish and Maureen for joining us this afternoon for this uh, webinar. Um, here is contact information for both of them, as well as the websites for the, for the MBUF program with the I-95 Coalition, as well as uh, Origo uh, website and uh, NGA's uh, website. We will post a recording of this webinar on our website um, in the next few days. So um, with that, uh, thank you again, Trish. Thank you, Maureen. Really appreciate you. I know you both uh, frequently come and participate in NGA educational settings, so I appreciate you doing it over the web as well. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, NGA. And thank you, Trish. Thank you, Maureen, and thank you, NGA, and all the participants. I appreciate the questions. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye.